and Carlton fans couldn't believe their eyes as the second quarter went on forever. The longest quarter recorded, and the Blues made the most of it. For the first time, there would be a morning match. North at home to Port Adelaide at Monica Oval in Canberra. And the locals love the aerial work of Winston Abraham. Full back of the century, Stephen Silvani made a rare blunder against Essendon. The Bombers would steam to victory. A 104-point loss to North Melbourne was the final straw for Fremantle. Jared Neesham announced he would see out the year, then leave. There were 52,000 at the MCG for a Monday night game under lights. Many had come to see Tony Lockett kick the two goals he needed for his record equaling sixth century. Many more came to see Melbourne cement a final place. No one was let down. Jason Dunstall came back for one last hurrah. He would retire after 269 games and 1,254 goals. He would do it in style too, on his own television show. I'll be retiring from league football. Others to bow out included Carlton's Peter Dean, Brisbane's Andrew Buse, and Collingwood's Richard Osman. North would win its ninth game in a row to secure top spot, beating the Bulldogs in one of the classic games of the decade. Richmond had one last chance to make September, but a devastating loss to the inform Melbourne ended their hopes. The Demons under Danaher had created AFL history by rising from last in 1997 to fourth in 1998. They would start the finals in fine form too, beating defending Premier's Adelaide by eight goals, Farmer and Neitz kicking six apiece. North would eliminate Essendon after a tight first half. Carey, predictably the star for the Roos. In a war of words before the game, Sheedy had likened some North figures to marshmallows. He would eat his words later. The Bulldogs toyed with a West Coast side that had been depleted through injury. Dual Premiership skipper John Worsfold, a last-minute exclusion, and he would not play again. In Sydney, there was a thriller. The Swans, despite Lockett being well held, would beat St Kilda by two points. North's Byron Pickett would create history by becoming the first player to win the Norwich Rising Star Award with a perfect score. St Kilda would lose to Melbourne in the first of the semi-finals. AFL Coach of the Year in 1997, Stan Alves, would be sacked and replaced by former Essendon great and Channel 7 newsreader Tim Watson. On a wet and windy night in Sydney, Peter Vardy ensured the Crows would go on as he kicked six in a 27-point win over Sydney. In Brisbane, the Lions excitedly announced the footy coup of the year as they signed Collingwood Premiership coach and AFL legend Lee Matthews as coach for three years. Matthews would hire his own support staff. Melbourne's hopes of rising from wooden spooners to premiers in a year was shattered in the preliminary final. North, superbly led by Corey McKernan, would win by five goals. The next day, Adelaide produced its best performance of the season, grinding the Bulldogs into the MCG with a 68-point humiliation. McLeod kicked seven and Robran six. It was a shattering end of the season for all Australian coach Wallace and his men, who had never been lower than second on the ladder. If some of the gloss had been taken off Robert Harvey's Brownlow win in 1997 by the suspension of Chris Grant, he proved his champion status beyond doubt in 98. He polled a record equaling 32 votes in 14 games to leave a quality field eight votes in his wake. The sixth player to win back-to-back -back medals, Harvey was again the consummate winner. The grand final of 1998 will be remembered with bitterness by North as one that was frittered away. With 21 scoring shots for six goals in the first half, the ruse were wasteful. When Adelaide took charge in the second half, they made the most of every opportunity. Jarman kicked five, and in a year when the repeat was the norm, Andrew McLeod was again the best player on the ground. It was a win that had coach Blight jumping for joy. Yeah, the fact that the Crows won two consecutive premierships, because I never thought they were that good. But they still won two consecutive premierships, so I think that was a bit of a surprise when that happened again.
Of all the players and all the stories to end the century, there could be no more imposing than Tony Lockett's successful chase for the league's longest standing goal kicking record. This would be his last season. He'd won a Brownlow, won four Coleman medals, and kicked the ton six times. But in 1999, he achieved what no other man in football history had. He kicked his 1300th goal. Will he write his name in the record book forever? Come on, play. With this kick. It's going to go! It's the goal! He's done it! Ah, and aren't we privileged to be a little part of it? With that one kick at the SCG in June against Collingwood, he erased Gordon Coventry's 62 year old record from the books. He's just going to keep rotating. In September, he would have one last tilt at that elusive premiership and face an early finals exit. Lockett played 278 games and kicked 1,357 goals. He'd kicked at least one goal in his final 111 games. It was a year that started tragically for the top big man in the competition. Sean Wren requiring a third knee reconstruction after this incident in the Ansett Cup match against Port Adelaide. He'd missed the year. Nearly 50,000 would see Hawthorne continue its renaissance of 98 to thrash Port Adelaide in the final. One of the oldest men in the game, Paul Salmon, overcame hamstring doubts to win the Tuck medal. Television personalities would have a profound influence on the year. Former Seven News reader Tim Watson suffering an 89-point hammering in his first outing as St Kilda's coach. Channel 9's Eddie Maguire, the new president of the Magpies. They'd lose too. Perennial Brownlow medal pick Nathan Buckley would miss a month after breaking his jaw in this round two collision with Carlton's Justin Murphy. But for Essendon skipper James Heard, the season was over almost before it began. Stress fractures in his foot had the champ sidelined and distressed. Peter Everett was again in trouble over a racial taunt to Melbourne Scott Chisholm. The All-Australian Ruckman voluntarily standing out for four matches and donating $20,000 to charity. And Coleman medalist Tony Modra moved across the Nullarbor from Adelaide to the Dockers. And in round two looked great. By round 10, he'd boot 10 against Melbourne. While Achilles' problems had sidelined Lockett, young bomber sensation Matty Lloyd was awesome. Against Sydney, he kicked 13 goals, the best Essendon Hall since the heady days of John Coleman in 1952. That's an Essendon forward line. Bennett in front of Lloyd. There were massive fightbacks, none better than Sydney, coming from 47 points down in the second quarter to win by two points against the Roos. McKernan doing the right work from behind. He's been excellent. Bomford to the left footer. He pumps it high. It's three. And there were heart stoppers. Melbourne snatching a last gasp victory over Hawthorne. The Demons build it, they've got a two for behind. There is time though. Hawthorne will get one good crack at this. Or oh, you will get a miss for it. Phoebe all across the line. Just to Walsh. That was close. Walsh away. And Melbourne has won it. The Demons by a point. Two weeks later, Daniel Harford would do the same for the Hawks, ending Geelong's brilliant opening streak of five straight wins. Why isn't the advantage He's going to give it. The umpire's going to now pay advantage. A late call, and it's a goal to the Hawkers. The Hawks have been magnificent here at Shell Stadium. Collingwood had lost 13 games in a row under Tony Shaw, their worst run in history. With Buckley back and brilliant, they'd end the suffering against Fremantle in round eight. Collingwood, he kicks, and he kicks a goal. That's a team lifter. And there it is. At last, says Tony Shaw. And Collingwood win their first game after 13 straight defeats. He's going to get. While Lockett was kicking nine against Collingwood on the way to breaking that goal kicking record, another former Brownlow winner, Tony Liberatore, was in the news too. He was suspended for three matches for eye gouging against Brisbane. 
Hawthorne drew with the Western Bulldogs, and then in round 12, staged the greatest comeback in history to.